Hello and welcome to today's luncheon discussion. Will the Congressional Review Act be revived in 2025? We are happy you are with us today. My name is Steve Schaefer and I'm the director of the Federal Society's Regulatory Transparency Project. This event is brought to you by the Federal Society's Capitol Hill Chapter and the Regulatory Transparency Project. Um, I want to thank Savannah Griesinger, who's my friend and colleague uh, and her team, as well as Marie Blanchard and Libby uh, Dickinson, who's on my team. Uh, note the following remarks are those of the panelists and not uh, those of the Federal Society. Uh, first, I am pleased to introduce the Honorable Susan E. Dudley, who is the founder and former director of the George Washington Regulatory Study Center, which she established in 2009 to raise awareness of regulation's effect and to improve regulatory policy through research, education, and outreach. She's also the uh, Distinguished Professor of Practice at the Trachtenberg School of Public Policy and Public Administration, uh, the past president of the Society for Cost-Benefit Analysis, and she also uh, served as the presidentially appointed administrator of the U.S. Office of Information and Regulatory Affairs from April 2007 through January 2009, which is commonly known as OIRA. Um, we are especially proud to have her as a member of the Regulatory Transparency Project, its uh, regulatory process working group, and uh, she was a, just an incredible uh, chair for the reg process group. And if you have the opportunity to know her, she's just a wonderful person. Um, so Susan, I'll turn it on over to you. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you to um, Savannah and Steve and the Federalist Society for hosting this event today. Um, yeah, I think I'll add, um, that was a very generous introduction. The one thing I'll add is that I was administrator of OIRA during the transition from Bush to Obama, so I have some firsthand experience on the topic. Um, I it seems to be my mic, so <laughs> I'll just turn it off. Um, so um, my introductions of my fellow panelists will be much more brief than Steve's of me. Um, Steve Bala is um, a professor of political science at the George Washington University and a co-director of the Regulatory Study Center. Um, Todd Gaziano is president of the Center for Individual Rights, and quite relevant for today is that he was the lead staff director, or lead staff drafter of the Congressional Review Act back in 1996. Um, and Anthony Papian is the majority staff director for the Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee, Subcommittee on Government Operations and Border Management that's chaired by um, Senator Kirsten Sinema. So let me first give a brief overview of the Congressional Review Act, um, and then we'll launch into questions from, so I should keep facing you to, yeah. Um, uh, I'll, I'll ask some questions, we'll have some discussions amongst ourselves, and then um, we, we want, would love to open it up to questions from you. So there'll be microphones that are brought, brought around. So these guys are gonna kick me under the table if we, um, or somebody should throw stuff at us if we go too far without stopping and asking questions from you. So the Congressional Review, Review Act used to always be um, prefaced with an obscure law, um, but I think it's no longer obscure, and the size of this audience suggests that's true. Um, it was passed in 1996 and gives Congress an opportunity to use streamlined procedures to disapprove regulations issued within the previous 60 session or legislative days. For regulations that are issued late enough in a congressional term, um, so that the um, that members of Congress don't have that full 60 legislative or session days to review, the review period then rolls over into the next Congress. And it's this so-called look-back provision um, that has made the CRA particularly salient during transitions, presidential transitions, because it offers an opportunity for a new president and a new Congress to overturn regulations issued at the end of the previous president's term. So the CRA wasn't used to disapprove a regulation until 2001 um, when Congress, with the support from the George W. Bush new White House, overturned an ergonomics regulation issued at the end of the Clinton administration. Um, but since then, it has been used to overturn another 19 
regulatory actions. President Trump signed 16 resolutions of disapproval, and President Biden signed three. We, um, looking at um, recent regulatory activity, this administration clearly has the threat of CRA disapprovals in mind. Um, <clears throat> an early estimate of the potential look-back date this year was, um, was in May. And what we, we saw in April and May, agencies issued a record number of economically significant regulations, those likely to have impacts of 200 million or more. They published 66 such regulations in April, which broke all records. Usually, that's five times more than the average month, number of economically significant regulations in an average month. And it's higher than any prior month going back as long as we have data on those regulations, um, including midnight periods where you usually see an uptick in regulatory activity. Um, so we, we've... There, at least apparently there's um, a real real concerns about the potential use of the CRA during um, if there is a potential if there is a transition. So let me turn to questions of this expert panel and Todd start with you. Um, so especially after the aggressive use of the CRA in the 115th Congress, it's perceived as a mostly Republican tool for use during presidential transitions. As, as a, one of the lead staff authors of the, of the act, was that the, was that the intent? Is that how you perceived it would be used? Thank, thank you, and thank you to everyone who's, who's come here to hear us on this arcane, not so arcane law. No, it, 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 it clearly was not um, the expectation or the intent when it was passed in 1996, um, although you can make some sophisticated arguments now that it's anti-regulatory, and I, I think my co-panelists may, and you may even disagree with that, but it, uh, it was bipartisan. Uh, its main sponsor included S Senator um, uh, Reid, um, and it passed, this, different versions of it passed the Senate 100 to zero, and on voice votes, it, different versions of it, it was a weaker version, Different versions of it passed the House a couple of times. It was one version was passed and sent to the president, but on another bill that he beat. Eventually, though, the White House even agreed, the Clinton administration even agreed, that it could be put on a different debt limit. Um, and I'm not exactly sure what the White House saw in it except to possibly increase congressional um, uh, responsibility uh, for regulations, but I can tell you from the congressional standpoint, it was seen much more of, as an institutionalist tool, and that's why people like Harry Reid and, and Nichols and Ted Stevens worked on it together and uh, others in the House. Um, it, was, uh, it wasn't assumed that presidents would veto all of the resolutions of disapproval, even for rules in their administration, and there's, there are four reasons for that, and a lot of that's in the joint legislative history. Um, one is that the president didn't have control of independent agencies, and that was a well-known problem, and that might allow the president to, mm -hmm. to veto regulations that he didn't approve. And in the Trump administration, um, at least one um, uh, 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 executive order was issued, or was it an OMB, you might remember, OMB order, I think that requires at least the independent agencies to submit rules for CRA review of whether they're major. But also, there, there was frequently, of course, an argument that the statute, the underlying regulatory statute, made the agency do this. Agencies love to claim that. Sometimes it's true, sometimes it's partially true. Um, but if that was either true or arguably true, a CRA resolution would get the president off the hook. Or, if he vetoed the resolution make him responsible because the CRA re resolution is a get out of jail from the underlying uh, statute um, scheme. It's also thought that maybe there'd be congressional pressure, maybe there'd be public pressure, even if the president kind of sort of liked uh, the regulation. Um, but again, it, it was understood as an accountability tool both for Congress and to a limited extent for Congress for, for the president because the president would own um, rules. It was thought that Congress would use the expedited procedures much more regularly and not just uh, after transitions. And finally, the legislative history is also clear that it was thought to uh, supply 
regulatory study centers and Congress with a lot more information on regulations, that would enhance congressional oversight. So again, this was a, an institutional, uh, a, a branch institutional uh, tool uh, that would be used for better oversight, more effective oversight, uh, a better study. So, so, so that was its original understanding and um, uh, led to a lot of frustration for years why Congress wasn't using it. Thanks. Um, and Steve Bala, related to that, you've done a lot of research, empirical research on it. Um, Todd said it, it hasn't been, it was expected to be used more regularly. Um, but we do tend to think of it as these, um, you know, the 20 disapprovals that I mentioned. But your research suggests that there is a lot more to it than that, its usage. Sure. Since the Congressional Review Act uh, became law in 1996, there have been 433 resolutions of disapproval introduced. That's, you know, accurate up to days ago. Uh, so is that a lot or a little? I mean, your, your mileage may vary. There have been obviously way more than 433 regulations, significant regulations, economically significant regulations in that period of time. But, um, but there it is. So 433 resolutions of disapproval have been introduced over the decades. Um, what I will say is these last two years have been a boon for the introduction of resolutions of disapproval. When I was charting this two years ago, the number of resolutions that had been introduced up to that point had been 249. So in other words, there have been about 200 resolutions of disapproval introduced in the last two years, accounting for almost 50% of the lifetime activity on the CRA. So the notion that it's obscure at least by some measure of that is dissipating as we see its use continue to increase over time. What I will say also is that um, to the two, I don't know if they're myths, but one myth is that it is may, uh, primarily a Republican deregulatory tool. If we, just, if we look at introductions of those 433, um, how many have been introduced by Republicans? It's about 85%. Um, so it's 367 versus 66 that have been introduced by Democrats. So clearly the, the action is disproportionately on the Republican side, although, again, Democrats have been making regular use of it, not as regular use as Republicans, but making regular use of it uh, from the beginning. Uh, there even have been recent resolutions of disapproval introduced by Democrats um, during the Biden administration. And, you know, um, uh, Senator Manchin introduced two before he left the Democratic Party. Senator Tester introduced one. Representative uh, Golden, who's from the second district in Maine, which is a district carried by uh, by President Trump and, rep, you know, and, and um, he has, you know, Representative Golden has the lowest rate of voting in agreement with the Biden administration. So, uh, so you can see the flavor of Democrats who at least in recent vintage have been active in this. Um, one um, last thing to note here is that um, when we look at when the resolutions of disapproval are introduced, 81% um, have been introduced outside of the look back period. So uh, we often pay attention to the look back period. I think that's why we're here now with an election coming up. We are in the look back period by any calculation. So this is certainly what makes the CRA salient to some degree. But if you look at just overall use of it, introductions, again, 81% are introduced outside of the look back period. Why would you introduce a resolution of disapproval during a period where you know there's essentially zero chance of that disapproval becoming law. Todd suggested a few reasons that the drafters of the legislation might have had in mind. I'll suggest another, which is position taking, symbolic politics. I mean, this is an easy way to take a public stance on, uh, on a government regulation. And so I think it's a, pretty, it's a pretty cheap, it's a mechanism of cheap talk, if you will, of position taking of symbolic politics. So in a number of ways, the actual use of the CRA has kind of confounded, I think, Todd and others' expectations who were there at the beginning. And those of us in the decades since who spent a lot of time trying to understand how it's actually used. I would expect, last point, is that um, depending on what happens um, in the upcoming presidential election and congressional elections, 
I would expect, you see waxing and waning. Right now, I think we're at a point of waxing in terms of Republicans really making the most use of it. But you can imagine scenarios where then we see, you know, let's say we have a Republican trifecta, you're gonna see the Republican percentage of introductions start to shrink really rapidly. And so uh, as Democrats make more use of it, uh, uh, potentially. Um, so it depends on what happens in the, in the upcoming election. Uh, excuse me. If there's a Republican trifecta, Republican use obviously will go way up. But if not, Democratic use could go up uh, as, we see, um, as we see these different waxing and waning over the course of a term. So for example, under Biden, almost all of the RDs at the beginning of the Biden administration were issued by, were introduced by Democrats. That was the Trump look back period. Then as what we've seen over time, more and more Republican usage. I'd expect that to be reversed. Let me just make it clear. I'd expect um, under a Republican president that we'd start with more Republican usage, but then as time goes by, Democrats would increasingly uh, make use of the introduction of RDs. Okay, hopefully I didn't, with my own confusion, confuse everybody <laughs> else too much. Thank you. No, I think that was very clear. Um, and actually, and that leads me to Anthony, because Anthony, you've got on the ground experience on this. Can you talk a little bit about why, um, why you think Democrats have been using it less, but also why they're using it at all? Yeah, so um, first off, just as an extra, um, views are my own, do not represent the committee, subcommittee, Kirsten, anybody I have been or ever will be associated with other than myself. Um, so starting from the top, um, I think the basic piece of this is it goes back to the, the core ideologies of both major parties, which I'll just use considering the room, uh, Ronald Reagan's nine scariest words in the English language. This is kind of the basis of everything it is, is government a force that can be helpful or a force that is hurtful? And that's really where everything comes from. So when you think about the salt the earth provision of a substantially, substantially similar rule, where does that fall? So from a democratic perspective, it is immediately, if you are looking to tweak or change, not complete 180, if you're gonna get tied up in that question of what is substantially the same, you it's just easier to reinterpret the rule. Now with the Loper Bright decision, who knows where that's gonna change things, but as of April 1 of this year, that, that was my full contention and I haven't done enough work and seen enough to see how Loper changes any of that. Um, so I think that's the first piece. It's just where we differ in how we see government's role in society. Um, moving through that, um, I think that, now I'm a big booster, I wish it was a lot, you know, a lot smaller number than the 81% for the Republicans introducing these, um, but it's to the performance piece that you mentioned, Steve, that this is a great get out of jail free card. Um, the thing you noted with the members that were listed there is that they are all from red states, um, either retiring in tough reelections. Um, I think this is an easy vote for any Democrat who's worried about their score of voting with the president right now. Um, I think they should be introducing more of them because it doesn't, they're not going to pass. Um, and so it becomes a free vote that Democrats can take to differentiate themselves. Um, even if you're not gonna get the requisite signatures to access the fast track provisions, um, it is something you can introduce a joint resolution on, Tuesday, um, on Monday, cut an ad on Tuesday, have it on the air on Wednesday, go back to your state on Thursday after the last votes and campaign on how you held the Biden administration to account and this is how you'll keep fighting for your district, state, whatever it may be. And so I have been a big booster of the political use of this tool um, just from that perspective that it allows you to draw that daylight between yourself and the, uh, the executive, especially during an election year. So I think that is why it should be used more because it is, it has become so much of a performative thing um, in, in our country. I think too, the reason we didn't see more of it at the beginning of the Biden administration was twofold. Um, we had the, um, it was a very busy, you know, February and March, we'd had the COVID rescue um, plan from December that had fallen apart. That became the American Rescue Plan in March. Um, 
and so from that perspective, we were just so busy from the time the Congress came back in 2021 through the majority of that window that there just wasn't a lot of opportunity. We were in, um, we were in executive session for so much of it in parliament, from a parliamentary perspective, it's very difficult to jump back and forth. It's very easy to object to the change in session in the, uh, in the Senate. So that also ate time where you couldn't just bounce back between topics all day. Um, so those are kind of the, the main pieces of this in terms of um, you know, why I think you see this division, why I think there maybe shouldn't be just for political purposes. Um, and then I think just, you know, to the point of, um, you know, if you do it with independent agencies, that it, um, it pulls in, uh, you know, the president more than they wouldn't be. I mean, mm -hmm. outside of this room, most people in America don't understand that difference. So I don't think it really, whatever the administration does, whether it be, you know, the, an independent agency or an executive, if you're in, you know, Nebraska or Colorado or California or Texas, like it is still, they are the chief executive. That is their responsibility if it is any way associated with the executive branch. Real quick on that, uh, you made an interesting point about how unique the period of 2021, the beginning of the Biden administration was in that Democratic trifecta. I mean, when you think about it, there have been two Democratic trifectas since the passage of the CRA. And both were the most unusual of times because we had the Great Recession at the beginning of the Obama administration and then COVID at the beginning of the Biden administration. So we haven't had, quote, a clean test of what democratic usage of the CRA as a look back mechanism could potentially be um, because of the kinds of uh, factors you're talking about. Just the world just swamped the CRA. Um, so just an, just an observation about how unusual those times were. Yeah, so I was um, administrator at the end of the Bush administration, and despite my best efforts, we had a lot of, we issued a lot of regulations at the end that would be subject to the CRA, and the Obama administration also didn't use it at all. And I always thought it was what Anthony referred to as the salt, the earth. So um, if you're not familiar with that, one of the um, aspects of the CRA is that after a, a a rule has been disapproved, the agency cannot issue something that is substantially similar. And so to Anthony's point, I think there were things that were done at the end of the, the Bush administration that the Obama administration might have done a little bit differently, but that they didn't just want to eliminate altogether and not be able to do anything substantially similar. So instead, they took the longer, slower um, approach of going back through and going through notice and comment rulemaking, which takes a lot longer to change the, the regulations. Um, we're going to get into the weeds a little bit more now. Um, so um, I, I mentioned that um, the Biden administration seemed to be working on a May deadline. Um, and, and that was the, the estimate of the look back date based on the legislative calendar at the time, and I think it might still be if you look at the written calendar, but Sarah Hay, the most excellent Sarah Hay, who is sitting here um, with the Regulatory Study Center, her count based on the legislative calendar um, and estimates of how many days Congress will be in session and all um, is that the deadline is probably, the look back date is probably closer to August 1st, end of July, August 1st, and um, the CRS, um, recently has made that same estimate. So Todd, talk to us a little bit about that. Why is it so hard to know the date? Sure, glad to. And, and I'll maybe give you a, a bit more background on, on the look, one other aspect of the, two other aspects of the look back provision in answering. Uh, the first is that that was how the look back provision, how far back it reached and how it worked, how far forward it worked, was the biggest change in the last version mm -hmm. and was something that um, occupied us when we were helping um, the, the, the members. So it, it was at least consciously thought about and debated at the time. And the early Senate version just said 60 days. Well, what if they jam you? And, you know, mm -hmm. what if, because that's when the look back was added, I think originally in the House, in the version that went through uh, the committee I served on. Uh, which was the government reform committee, um, but also, but then there was a general understanding among the sponsors that that 
would would allow the administration to you know jam jam Congress. So one of the other uh, provisions that you got you didn't get wrong, but you didn't fully explain is when a regulation falls within the look back. By the way, this all is whether when certain expedited procedures apply, particularly in the Senate, that overrides the filibuster. Um, some expedited procedures apply throughout, but the most important ones are affected by this, this look back provision. But when a rule falls into it, it doesn't just get the extra days in the new session, it gets 60 new legislative days, but not just 60 new legislative days because it was discussed that, well, Congress has got to organize and they've got to form committees and these should go through committees. And so it actually starts on the 15th day of, so really 75 new legislative days. So anyway, this was, this was at least um, uh, quite understood, but, I, was, uh, but I, I did kind of enjoy being the only one or one of the few people who understood the interest keys of this obscure and whatever <laughs> law that was this patchwork until, you know, now, now more and more people know it. But I was especially amused when CRS used to sort of, or people used to use shorthead definitively say, the look back period before the end of a session is exactly May or June or July. Well, you, you can't know until the session is over. And so what are the implications of that? And I think that's what <laughs> Susan was hoping I'd eventually get to is that um, one or the other house can affect the look back, can confound the current, the current estimate probably is a very good estimate and is likely to happen if the House and Senate keep to their current schedule. They, so they added days in August, I understand, which then affected the look back. But if they want, they could meet a lot less. Now, Maybe there are many, many reasons why they don't want to do this. But for example, the House. If the House really anticipated a Donald Trump victory and that they could gain control of the, South, the, the, the Senate and they really wanted this opportunity, they could meet a lot less than they're planned in August, September. Uh, uh, if if it's their, their hopes are confirmed in the election, they could try not to meet at all. Now, of course, there's a constitutional provision that no House can recess for more than three days without the consent of the other, but maybe they could get consent. Uh, the president could try to call them back in special session. They could come back, but then adjourn. You know, there's, is, is any of that likely to happen? In my view, there's always excuses, or not excuses, I shouldn't say that. I respect the reasons why, but in my view, some, sometimes it would be worth at least um, thinking about whether uh, the, the uh, House or the Senate, if they want to capture this opportunity can, um, uh, can change their schedule to affect, uh, look back, uh, the Senate meets in pro forma sessions, even during long recesses to prevent recess appointments and other reasons. Uh, th that mean the House needn't concern that, or they may decide that recess appointments aren't that important because the president could fire most of them. Um, so it, it's at least worth thinking through. And, I really love um, uh, uh, Steve's statistics, and I might comment on one or two the other uh, of them later, but, but I will mention that what I care most about is, I agree that there is this, perform both Anthony and Steve, there is this performative use, and that's reasonable. I, I, I think that actually is, can be used as effective oversight, but I care more about when they actually try to make a, a law, even if they don't succeed. And that's when it really has an independent effect, even more so if they submit something uh, to, the, to the president. So um, I, I think that's a special class. And I think when there is an actual attempt to make legislation, it's um, uh, not serious to say that that's, that's, or not right to say it's, it's, it's performative. And that's, a, that's a, a particularly, I think, useful use of the Congressional Review Act. Any comments on that before I keep going? So not on that specific point, but on the look back uh, mm -hmm. window in general and data, like how important the look back window and estimating it has been for driving regulatory activity in the Biden administration. So at the Regulatory Studies Center, uh, we, have, um, we have a tool 
where you can track um, which regulations would be open to being uh, CRA'd, if you will, um, based on when the look back window opens. So you can just plug in a look back window start date and we will pop out all of the regulations that fall within that look back period as of right now. And I was playing around with the tool before coming over here and right now the current estimate is August 1st or thereabouts was when we went into the look back period. So that would mean, you know, right now there's 268 final rules that are uh, susceptible to being CRA'd. Um, only seven of them are economically significant, the 3F1 uh, economically significant rules. And, but if you toggle the date back to April 1st, before the, the Biden administration's you know, regulatory rush, if you will, the number of final rules that would be vulnerable to a CRA challenge goes from 268 to 1,283. Okay, that's fine. But what really stood out to me was the number of economically significant rules goes from seven to 72. So even if you move the look back window and our you know, toggle it back in our system to May 22nd, which is sort of the date by the stated congressional calendar, we know there are gonna be all these pro forma days, it's not May 22nd, but there it's only 11 economically significant rules. So, so the Biden administration was quite strategic in rolling out economically significant rules, you know, before that May 22nd date, because we see that there's, you know, literally 70 of them uh, that were timed specifically, unless you have a better explanation to avoid uh, being issued in the look back period. Can I fine tune my answer? Just one other thing. I, I want to look at, the, I haven't looked at these CRA estimates in a while. Again, I tend not to look at them because I say, well, how can you say what, what, what when, the, but the expedited procedures are the most significant in the Senate without, without a doubt, but each house's clock works independently. So again, given just the current situation, um, the house could try to change its calendar. And then if a rule is captured and let's say there is then the trifecta in the election, the House, if the House can capture something that has expired in the Senate, a resolution in the House could pass, it then goes, and then that vote is not subject mm -hmm. to the filibuster if it actually comes in from the other House. Mm -hmm. So that is a way in which one House can change the yeah. scope of the look back provision that's very different. So again, I'm not sure about um, whether there's separate calculations, because I haven't looked at the last one. And, but, but if the House really wants to do something, they needn't care about pro forma Senate days as long as they're yeah. otherwise proceeding constitutionally. So doesn't that, though, kind of run up against the reality of how we, we deal with spending, for lack of a better term, where you see, you know, I mean, we've got three weeks to get the CR done at this point, or an omnibus spending bill, which we know we're not going to do. Um, National Defense Authorization Act still has to even come up in the Senate. Um, you know, then it just depends what sort of lame duck we have with what types of legislation we're moving forward. Um, I personally have stopped buying plane tickets at Christmas um, as a result of my work in the Senate. So it's, you know, we still have this rigmarole. And so, it, you know, I feel like there are these mechanisms that we can use to influence these dates, but then, you know, the school bus of reality runs the red light. Um, and we're just stuck in the standard, you know, standoff to where we kind of have to push till the last minute to get something done. Um, just the way we've been legislating the last, you know, what feels like eternity, but it's probably more like a decade. Sure, and yeah. you're, you're absolutely <laughs> yeah. right about all that. Again, I, I'm not meaning to, to weigh, I, I, except to put this on. Some people I don't think are, are, are conscious of it, um, but maybe they'll learn a lesson next Congress oh, yeah. or the Congress after that. And they'll say, why did we meet in July? It's hot and steamy. <laughs> and why do we meet in August? It's hot and steamy. We know we're not going to get the budget done. We know we've got to allow 20 days to do our annual job then, uh, let's not meet, you know, anyway. Yeah. So, no, 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 so, no. So, I totally so, get you. It's just, it's, it's um, uh, and, I'll, and I'll make one other 
one of my pet peeves about how I also heard about how many, you know, I was surprised that the uh, Biden administration, for some reason Steve mentioned, didn't use it. And there, there's some, their, their fear of the, I don't call it salt of the earth, I call it the anti-circumvention provision, which if it didn't exist, the law would be worthless. Because if an agency could just reissue the same yeah. rule, it, you know, um, no one wanted that. I don't know why they call it salt. No, anyway. <laughs> uh, uh, one of the other arguments for um, even not using it as much as it was in the Trump administration was that, well, even 10 hours of debate is limited to 10 hours. The filibuster is probably, but a ten, 10 hours of debate is so valuable. That's the maximum. You don't have to go. The law says that it could be any amount that a majority, it could be, you you could have successive votes on, th you do have to do them individually. There's There's been legislation introduced, which I think would improve the act to allow, you know, grouping. But you could do it individually, but you could do them sequentially and you could have 15 minutes of debate on each or an hour on each. I mean, if Congress really wanted to use the tool, um, some, of, some of the reasons they didn't use it as much as they have, to me, really do smack of excuses, like the, oh, it takes 10 hours of debate. That, that one just doesn't pass my... I mean, you know how many judges you can do in 10 hours? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's the exact point, right? It's people, we can always find an excuse for why we're not going to do something on the Hill. Um, and that's, it's just a matter of whatever the convenient line is. I want to um, go back quickly and make another plug for the regu GW Regulatory Study Center CRA dashboard. Um, which, if you're interested in this, you might enjoy playing with. Um, the website is go.gwu.edu slash CRA dashboard. So pretty easy. And um, in addition to what Steve mentioned is that you can figure out all the regulations. Um, you can, div you can um, sort it. So by you could look, if you're only interested in a particular agency or only interested in those regulations that have impacts of 200 million or more, you can sort it in different ways. Um, so um, I'm be thinking of questions because we'll be turning to you soon. Um, Anthony, is this on Congress's radar? I mean, Todd is suggesting it should be more on your radar. Um, in terms of the deadline, I mean, I think it's on a very specific set of radars, um, but I think it applies more to the administration. I mean, to the point that if you slide from August 1 back to April 1, you know, this in massive increase in the number of rules that are eligible. So I think what you're actually seeing is the influence of making the, you know, the midnight rules period of an administration a kind of, I guess, maybe mid-afternoon <laughs> rules, um, just, just due to the fact that this, you know that, you know, you're safe up until, and then you're starting to get into a little bit of troubled waters. So I think that's really where you see the influence mm -hmm. of the power of the rule. And I think, I mean, to your point, I know when we were just discussing before, um, you know, still being at the office, you know, at 12.20 in the morning on, you know, January 20th, back in, back in 2009. Um, you know, we saw it again towards the, um, you know, towards the end of the Obama administration. You know, we were talking about midnight rules. That was a big issue on the Hill at that point in his GAC we, um, at that period of time. Then the Trump administration arrived. The CRA was used. Now all of a sudden you see the next Democratic administration pumping out these same kind of traditionally midnight regulations in April during what would be deemed a safer period to avoid um, a potential CRA vote. So I think it's, it's dictating more of the executive. Now the counter of that could just be that for the first, gosh, it feels, I guess, two years, um, a wire was out without a f uh, confirmed administrator. So that too could have been part of the problem where there was just a pile up of not having a confirmed and they came out then, you know, I'm not in the room, so I can't make that, you know, I can't tell you what it was, but that could also have been a piece of that puzzle. But yeah, another thing that's interesting is that this, I mean, at the end of the um, uh, Bush and Obama administration, it was at the end of eight years, you knew that was going to be the end of this administration. It's interesting to me that we saw such an uptick in what might have just been a mid, you know, 
um, no transition at all. All right. Um, maybe I'll just ask sort of a, a last free for all question is do you, since we're on Capitol Hill and there are a lot of Hill staffers here, do you have suggestions for Congress that we haven't already heard? Maybe, I know, Todd, we've heard your advice on days. Are there other things we should discuss before we open to questions? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll throw one more. Yeah, I wouldn't repeat myself. <laughs> um, there are ways, the substantially similar is the one most novel uh, term of art in the statute, and there, last I looked, there still hadn't been much, if any, um, judicial authority, but I'm probably wrong. I think maybe I heard about one that I didn't look up. Um, but there are ways, if you're afraid of that, um, I'm for accountability. I'm for Congress taking control in, in a nonpartisan way. And the legislative history even addresses some of that. One of the, the provisions that is nothing after the enacting clause can vary from the text. But you can put a lot in the preface. And the preface and the debate, I'll give the short version, and, and if someone really wants, I could give a slightly longer version. There are ways that Congress can make clear what it is they're disapproving, and depending on what the underlying law, the amount of discretion the underlying law, where the rule was issued under, how that intersects, um, they can probably make a pretty clear legislative history that it's this provision of this rule that we're disapproving. And we are not saying that, you know, and, and like, like any other act, the congressional disapprovals become an act of Congress, you can create legislative history around them with colloquies. And if everyone in Congress agrees that, you know, people who oppose this resolution want at least this. People who are for it want at least this. We're 100% in agreement. That, you know, so anyway, there are, there are ways that you can um, narrow, if, you, if Congress really wants to, or for that matter, slightly expand. It's harder to expand, but I think narrow um, the, the scope of the anti-circumvention uh, provision. Oh, that's interesting. So Steve and I were talking about this before you arrived, actually. Uh, so in, in how you could use, well, the sense of the Congress isn't binding. Um, it is something that's being voted on. So it gets you out of the trouble of especially originalism and legislative history. And so if you have, because um, you know, nobody reads a legislative history unless they're on committee and have to, um, and <laughs> if there's a true ambiguity, legislative, yeah. you know, textualists will even say it's resort. But I think courts have said that purposes kind of statements yeah. are in well, the I think, statute I think this is are not yeah. the actual text, but are more are especially relevant. And so that's why a prefatory mm -hmm. note about why it is, you know, and and then it's and therefore the rule is disapproved. I think courts would. Oh, yeah. Especially. And I think just having that, you know, having that extra piece within a resolution to say this is why we are doing this as a sense of the Congress gives that gives that protection to what is actually being rejected as part of that joint resolution of disapproval, which makes it a much more bipartisan exercise going forward. Because, I mean, what we had about 200 in the last two years that were filed. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you're getting away from the, well, I'm just filing for the sake of filing to the real meat and potatoes where you have to negotiate over what those words are. You've created bipartisan buy-in and all of a sudden you've created, you know, we've, we've end rounded the, uh, the tricks in the intervening years to really go back to what the crux was, which is a tool for Congress to, to promote its Article I authorities um, as a co-equal branch to the executive, which is really the whole point of this. And this helps us get there in a manner that keeps everybody more comfortable, I guess, with the outcome. Since we've been talking about the look back period, I'll throw one more thing into the mix. <laughs> and that is, what if we fixed the date of the start of the look back period? So I'd be interested in fellow mm -hmm. panelists or anyone in the audience, you know, if you start gaming that out, 
what would be the advantages and disadvantages of having a known fixed date for the start of the look-back period? Oh, that's an interesting question. I, I, I can imagine advantages and disadvantages. Um, one is, again, back to the kind of um, sponsor's intent to not allow the administration to you know, game their fair opportunity. So if you set a particular calendar date, but there was COVID or there, you know, there was a war, or there was, you know, one of the, some of the other emergencies, then, then that does seem to limit the, the um, ability of Congress. But, you know, cl clarities, the clarity would have, would have some, some, some benefit. Um, I am much less worried about clarity and much more interested in opportunity for Congress to take responsibility and the president to take responsibility. Mm -hmm. Accountability to me tr trumps everything else. So, heck, I'd you know make the look back period three years, <laughs> but 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 that's me. I mean, I'm not great at math. That's why I went into public policy. So. <laughs> All right, we would love to hear questions from, from all of you. So Marie and B, I guess, have mics. Hi, Randy Johnson with the Cornell Law School, but I also co-chaired the National Coalition on Ergonomics, the first time uh -huh. that we ever used the Congressional Review Act. And it was a huge battle, very successful, but we barely won it. I think we only won it at the end because the administration was foolish enough to preempt state workers' compensation law, which got a Senator Specter's vote. But my point is, it was, it was front page of the Washington Post back then, a big deal. And then there was an abeyance, I think, of not using it. And now it's kind of like, okay, it's almost run of the, run of the mill. And I'm just wondering, I think we sort of viewed it as a nuclear weapon back then, and maybe now it's like, okay, let's do the Congressional Review Act. It's sort of like, it's not that big of a deal, let's give it a shot. And maybe that's a function of people are familiar with it, or maybe it's a function of a general, a growing disrespect for the agencies, a la Chevron, et cetera, that's led to like, oh, it's no big deal, let's just do the Congressional Review Act. I'm just saying, compare it back to 95, where we laid the groundwork for over three years for those votes and barely won it. Uh, it just seems to be a different prism now. And I don't know if any, that's just a global. And the other question would, Susan, would be more like, has anybody litigated the substantially similar provision yet? And what's that mean? On, on the first point, I think the interesting thing about if you look at rules that have been disapproved under the CRA, ergonomics is maybe a bit unusual because most of them are not economically significant. Um, so if we start just rattling off the rules that have been CRA'd successfully, um, even in this room, probably most of us would have never heard of most of them. Like where we all like know the story of ergonomics and like how big of a rule that was and, and like how, you know, how fraught the politics were. And, but boy, it's, it's not a lot of economically significant rules by and large. So that makes it different than the, the nuclear weapon option. Yeah. And what about... Have, Todd, 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 this is an unusual Federalist Society event in that we only have one lawyer on the panel. So Todd, all these questions Again, are Again, I you. don't, I don't think, last I looked, no one had, because there has to be a disapproved rule and then an agency has to try to do it. And so rules that were disapproved in the, by, the Trump administration, he wouldn't try to redo, so it would be the next administration. So it's, it, it, and then someone has to litigate over it. But I will just expand a teeny bit in, and this is again discussed in, in anticipated discussed in legislative history of how the anti-circumvention provision would operate if the law that from which the regulation was issued is truly prescriptive and it was an on and off switch. You know, EPA can do a study and either do this or do that and they did this and then it's disapproved. Well, then the agency's left with very little discretion. But Unfortunately, Congress delegates far too much. Maybe after Loper Bright, that'll change. But anyway, so most of, uh, of, of, of uh, there's usually an opportunity to do a lot. And one of the CRAs that failed in the Trump administration, the only one that went to vote and failed, um, was McCain uh, switched. And it was, uh, someone will remind me that it was a, it was a, uh, uh, petrochemical sort yeah, of issue, emissions. but it was an emission. But 
there, I think Senator Port was trying to make the case that what I was suggesting, that, that no, we could still have this regulation, we just wouldn't have this regulation. McCain wasn't convinced. That's all reasonable, but it does, it, it, that, that it somewhat turns on the nature of the underlying law and how much discretion the agency has and then how clear Congress is and all those things would factor in. So there probably isn't just one substantially similar answer in court cases. There, if a court decides this issue, it'll be based on all of those, those issues. Uh, on substantially similar, I believe, and you all can fact check me if I have this wrong, I think there may be a pair of Department of Labor regulations that have been issued in the wake of uh, successful resolutions of disapproval. So we do have now test cases of agencies picking up the baton of CRA rules and trying to you know, advance them forward. So I don't know that there's been litigation in those spaces yet, but that certainly is the next step in that direction. I believe one of those was um, the drug testing for unemployment, so it's you either don't or you do, and you can't say those are the same, which yeah. is, again, yeah. part of the problem. They were you know, objectively much different. So I think that that even creates some problems there. Uh, Liam McKenna, I'm with the minority on the Senate Commerce Committee. Uh, just want to make two quick points. One is that the look back period uh, is not, will not, and, and never was going to be in April or May. Um, the May 1st date that I saw floating around, I think, was just taking the legislative days and not counting pro forma sessions, which do count. So uh, I think August 1 is probably the earliest. I, I hope it's around August 1, but um, it could potentially be later, depending on sort of gamesmanship. And, and that kind of plays into to Todd's comment about why we might not want a fixed date in statute, because then it's up to the admin, not up to Congress, to decide how far back it, it can look. The other point I wanted to make is you talked a little bit about Democrat use of the CRA. Um, and I think one point that's worth thinking about there, probably talking against my own interests here, but is that it often takes a rule to, to uh, repeal a rule. And that would be subject to CRA as well. But those are just comments, so feel free to respond if you feel. Hi, uh, Phil Wallach, American Enterprise Institute. Um, it's possible we could see legislative filibuster reform in the Senate. That's, I'm not saying that's likely, but it's certainly something that gets talked about. Uh, if we did see the Senate moving to being able to just move all of its legislation with 50 votes plus the tiebreaker, would that be the end of the usefulness of the CRA, given the importance of the fast track provision to its use. I mean, I guess from all what you've all said, it would it would possibly still retain some of its usefulness as a position taking device. But in terms of actually thinking about uh, its use in, in setting up votes on the Senate agenda, it, it would still have some other uses. And uh, by the way, I hope I, uh, it's. I don't seem partisan, but I, I think the legislative filibuster has a much different argument for it um, because when Congress legislates in the first instance, it's usually setting down very broad and, and extensive rules. And I think that's where, um, um, who was the uh, AEI scholar uh, who, uh, whose name escapes me on, on the book about the importance of compromise and that sort of thing. For, for the CRA, the understanding was, okay, we've already passed this law, Congress has already passed this law, the agency's already done this extensive records and sometimes hearings and, and whatever and, and, and issued the rule for an up and down vote on whether they did a good job or not. Congress just needs, you know, expedited procedure. Um, so even if you, uh, uh, with you know, ended the filibuster completely for legislation, a couple of the other provisions of CRA would still make it more useful to disapprove rules, which is that you can't um, uh, change the uh, wording of the resolution, and the second house has to pass the first house, so there can be no conferences, there can be no delays 
from, from com conferences. It's a simple fill in the blank, um, and then there are rules about, you know, cons cons taking action on another house's uh, uh, version. So there's still s some advantages um, to, that would exist to using a CRA as opposed to the normal legislative uh, when you have a 600-page bill on one house that has to be reconciled or agreed to with a 500-page bill in the other house. Other questions? Yes, there's one over here. <laughs> All right. Mike Fox, then, is his guy under Anthony. My question was, Todd mentioned Loper Bright, and do we think Loper Bright, I still don't think this works, no, it whatever. Is. It, it is. is. It is. Or it does. Okay. Do we think Loper Bright would make, in theory, make Congress write more prescriptive legislation, maybe less non-delegation, hence less use of the CRA? Sorry, less delegation, hence less use of the CRA. Is that a plausible outcome? I hope so. I hope so, too, and one of the pieces I wrote first in response to the um, West Virginia versus EPA decision is, oh, there was a, I was sort of making fun of a Harvard law professor, that's easy to do sometimes, um, who said, oh, we, 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 we can't eliminate major, you know, we can't, we can't, because Congress can't possibly legislate. And I, I then, um, was talking to some other scholars who were friends of, uh, of ours about sometimes Congress writes very prescriptive um, laws when it suits the tax laws come, come to mind. Very, very detailed amortization tables, you know, in, in the law. So, so my, my conclusion is, is if, if Congress um, has the incentive to do so or is made to until the court, but the Congress wasn't going to until the court kind of, again, put the onus back on them, makes them do it. And my final thought is if, if current members of Congress aren't able in some sense to, to legislate like they used to or in the detail that necessary, then we the people need to elect different Congresses. So it's a di very dynamic. Congress doesn't have to, so we elect congressmen who engage in more performative and less legislative. I mean, there was always that mix, right? But to the extent that the courts allowed Congress to shirk the duty, we the people then elected different members. It's, it's a, it, there, there could be or should be many dynamic aspects that could, could, take, to, could take decades, uh, or it could all fizzle and the Supreme Court will reverse itself and <laughs> will, will, will be ruled by you know, bureaucrats. There's a question there. And this might be our last question. Uh, Dan Goldbeck, American Action Forum. Um, kind of jumping off that last question and your discussion earlier about you know, events overtaking, particularly the uh, Obama and Biden uh, administrations early on. Say there is a Republican trifecta. Um, what do you think is going to be the priority of uh, CRAs versus more traditional legislative things? Like I know there's talk of a big reconciliation package, that sort of thing. What do you think is going to be the main priority of Republicans at that point? Well, just one thing quickly is I think there will not be a lot of controversial rules to disapprove. I really do think that they were really issued earlier. I should call out to Dan's organization your estimate of the, the costs of regulations issued in the first four months of this term, so pre, before the window with the potential deadline, um, was a trillion dollars by agency's own estimates of the costs. So. I think a lot of the controversial ones have been issued, but there are probably more sophisticated answers to Dan's question. A non-sophisticated answer <laughs> is, I think if there's a Republican trifecta with President Trump, that there will be a strong incentive to use the CRA pretty extensively. And again, like I mentioned a few minutes ago, most instances of disapprovals are not economically significant rules. So there will be plenty of things you know, that have been issued in the look back window that raise the hackles of some member of Congress. And so I think there'll be plenty of usage of it because it's still, I think, a priority of the administration and, and Donald Trump. So I would be, I would, I would expect there to be substantial use of it. 
mainly on rules many of us have not paid that much attention to. Let me just quickly mention one other possible use that any administration can use when, particularly when in, in this hyperpartisan world, the uh, Congress is on their side. You can send to Congress guidance documents that should have been sent years ago, but were never sent. And it's only then that, that it triggers the, there was one disapproval at the end of the Trump administration on a guidance document that wasn't submitted and there's no judicial review of it, but I don't think that's proper. So no one, no one but me can challenge that, but it is clear. Uh, so, so that could be another use. Trump, mm -hmm. there are, there, but that, it is now firmly established that so-called sub-regulatory guidance documents are covered. That was very intentional by the sponsors in the definition of the rule. It covered explicitly to cover such guidance documents. So if there are thousands and thousands of guidance documents that Trump doesn't want to take the time to repeal or wants to salt the earth with their repeal, um, it could um, at any time uh, formally submit them um, with the expectation that they be uh, reviewed. And then, and, and then, depending again on the legislative history, um, the agency would be uh, prohibited from ever issuing a substantially similar uh, guidance, again, without express authorization in law. Todd, what if, um, what if an agency were to issue a something that just affirmed a regulation that it didn't like? Would that create a new action for Congress to disapprove? Uh, we, those of us who really nerd out on this go through all those hypos, and one of them is, is that you know, a, a request, a, a private request to repeal a rule um, you can't often get the agency to act on it fast, but when the agency says no, so you can for you can you know petition a petition under the APA. You could petition an agency um, to repeal this awful regulation that you issued 20 years ago because it's hurting us, and the agency says no. That is a rule. That no is a rule that is then should be submitted to Congress, and if not submitted to Congress, or submitted to Congress by the president. So if you really want to be hmm. wonderfully creative, you, you could use it in that way. I, I think our time is up. Do we have, yeah. Did you want to ask? No, I just wondered if anyone had last words, but I think oh. we've had plenty of words. Oh. So. <laughs> well, please uh, join me in thanking this excellent panel. Was fun. And I wanted to thank all of you for attending uh, today's event and all of those of you who are listening to this at a later time. If you'd like more content like this, uh, please check out regproject.org. That's regproject.org or fedsoc.org. Fedsoc.org. Thank you. <laughs>